So welcome to the first colloquium of this semester. And I hope um, that we'll continue meet every Friday. And uh, I look forward to getting your feedback, comments, suggestions. Um, and I hope you will tell others on the campus about the university colloquium on Friday afternoon. Uh, today we have with us um, Dr. Deepa Sinha. Deepa did her master's in economics from Jawaharlal Nehru University, followed by MSc in development studies from SOAS. And uh, I see many students in the audience who are uh, students of MA development program. Uh, and then she did uh, work with commissioners to Supreme Court on the petition that was PUCL, PUCL versus Union of India that we know also as a petition that led the way towards legislating right to food. Uh, so she was part of right to food campaign. Uh, she was at the secretariat in uh, Delhi coordinating at the commissioner's office. Uh, and after having done that sort of work in the civil society, she returned to academia. Um, in 2008, she came to do a PhD in economics from JNU. She has a book that came from uh, Rutledge, India in 2016. Uh, many of you who visited library today would tell me that you have seen actually that poster author on campus. And her book is very important book for many of the students in MA economics, MA development, MA education, and other disciplines as well. Because she asks us to probe into the reasons of why there is this differences in terms of development indicators among states. Why do we see certain human development indicators being reported from southern states? And why do other states lag behind? What are the historical, sociological reasons about the differences in development indicators amongst different states? Today, we have asked her to tell us not just her own response to the union budget 2022, but for us to trace um, through her talk what has been the last two years of pandemic in India, uh, what those two years have meant for the kind of um, progress that the campaign had met. Um, and we had certain hopes after National Food Security Act getting legislated, NFSA provisions being put in practice. And what happened to the food security and nutrition security for many of the urban and rural poor in India. And while we do see around us the talk about economic recovery, um, and those of you who have seen budget speech being delivered by finance minister would know um, how she speaks about a certain narrative of economic recovery. Uh, we have asked Deepa to tell us a bit on what this means. Um, how do we engage with those narratives of economic recovery? How do we read into the allocations? Um, thanks a lot again for all of you to coming in, uh, for coming in. And I hope we will have a very fruitful conversations with Deepa. And uh, I hand over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Himanshu and team for inviting me here. It's, it's, uh, it's quite a pleasure to be physically in front of people and speaking after a very long time. Uh, that itself was exciting, and I hope at the end of this you'll find this useful as well. Uh, like Himanshu said, I mean, when he uh, contacted me, it was mainly to talk about the union budget this year, but I thought I would use this opportunity to also um, draw your attention to some issues related to the issues of health, education, social protection, and so on. And 
uh, in the context of economic recovery as well. And I think that is one of the main broader questions that came out of the various discussions in response to the budget this year, as well as to the way it was uh, posed. So I won't only talk about the budget, but a little bit of the broader context as well, and then get into the budget as such. So one thing which, being students of uh, development and economics, which many of you would be familiar with, uh, but also useful to remind ourselves is that India has had this record of being slow in its improvements in human development indicators, and the slowness is something uh, bordering on stagnation in many indicators. That's been sort of uniform throughout a long period in post-independence India. It's not something that has happened only over the last uh, 10 years, but we've had some good years and some bad years, but it's never been great in terms of how we do uh, how India would be expected to do in, in relation to its per capita income or to its economic growth rates, particularly after the 90s. But even before that, if you see, uh, say, compared to a country like South Korea or so on, the rate at which literacy rates went up and so on has been uh, slow. And even during high growth years, after liberalization as well, uh, you see that continued. Just some examples I'll show you. Uh, for instance, the Human Development Index that the UNDP uh, brings out, India ranks 131, which is again uh, out of about 190 countries, which is not a great rank, and its rank is lower in terms of human development than it is in terms of just our per capita um, income. And if we look at the improvement in the HDI, then it has been, the HDI has started coming out since 1990, so we have data for three decades. The last decade, the rate of improvement has been the lowest. So one is it has always been slow, it has been poor outcomes, but what we also see in the recent period, that it's uh, in many indicators, it seems to have become slower in terms of its improvement. This is uh, Niti Aayog's own uh, indicator on multidimensional uh, poverty, which is based on, again, UNDP has now adopted it. It's uh, the al Kire foster method. But because we don't have poverty ratios, we don't have an official poverty line anymore, and we don't have consumption expenditure survey of the NSS based on which official poverty figures were brought about earlier, what we have is this is what the Niti Aayog has brought out. And on this basis, again, the headcount ratio, which is how many people are considered to be multidimensionally poor, is 25%. So one in four Indians is, is, uh, is a person who is multidimensionally poor, much higher in rural areas, so one in three rural Indians is a poor person by this definition, um, only 9% in urban, and you can see the map sort of shows you, although we don't have time to get into that today, but this is to uh, also kind of draw interest in my other work that Himanshu mentioned, is that the way this is distributed across different states, also there is a clear pattern with the poverty rates being highest, the oranges and the yellows and reds, the central uh, north kind of belt, the Hindi-speaking states, that is where the poverty rates are higher, and the southern states are more in the greens. Okay, again, this is broadly a pattern of north-south, but like you can see, further north, Punjab, uh, Kashmir, Himachal, and so on, also are uh, better off. What's more concerning is that before we get into the impact of uh, COVID, on human development is that in the last five years, post-2015, we see evidence, many different kinds of evidence, showing that there has been a slowdown. A lot of work and data on this is from uh, here itself, from uh, the Azim Premji University, like the State of Working India report and so on. You see that before COVID began, we found out that the unemployment rates, the official the unemployment rates that you see from the NSS survey was the highest in four decades. Again, unemployment rate means people who are actively seeking work and not finding work. There's also the whole set of people who don't, particularly women, who don't report themselves as acti actively seeking employment. That has also been falling. And uh, unem open unemployment rates have also been going up. Stagnant rural wages has been another issue uh, since about 2015, uh, particularly after 2016, and many have related this to uh, demonetization and six months later the introduction of GST 
and the impact that both of these had, particularly on the informal economy and small and medium in industries, that this was not just those six months, that there was uh, the impact of these which went on for a couple of years, and then, of course, COVID came. Increasing inequality, again, all of you would have uh, seen the recent reports. There was the Oxfam report, there's the World Inequality Report, the newspapers covered this in the front page. Again, not something that has happened only after 2015. After the post-90s, we see increasing inequality in India. But that is a process that has continued, although the economic growth rates uh, fell. So, for instance, the World Inequality Report finds that India is one of the most unequal countries, with the top 10% population's share in national income being 57%. So the top 10% earn more of the income that is generated, while the bottom half gets only 13%. So what we seem to be seeing post-2015 is not only widening gaps, but also that the bottom quintile is becoming worse off. So in the previous decade, without going into the details too much, if you look at the period of the 2000s, particularly 2004 to 10, we saw that absolute poverty rates actually fell. And they fell the fastest in the post-liberalization period in that time, uh, after 2005 to about 11, 12. That fall in poverty, absolute poverty also, seems to have stagnated. We, again, that is something that we don't have data on, because after 2011, 12, there hasn't been a consumption expenditure survey. But the consumption expenditure survey that was done in 2017 was leaked in the media. Um, based on that leaked report, the 2017-18 report does seem to show this, that the consumption expenditure for the poorer quintiles actually declined in real terms, which would suggest that absolute poverty increased. Right? So both relative poverty in the sense of inequality between the rich and the poor uh, going up, and also the poor becoming poorer. That is something that we didn't see in previous periods, but uh, seems to be happening now, post-2015. There is another paper by Jean Drez, Ashish Gupta, and others, which looks at infant mortality uh, decline in 2017 and 18, and they again find the paper itself is called Slowdown, Pauses, and Reversals in Infant Mortality. So infant mortality is one indicator where it has been improving uh, reasonably okay, particularly after the National Health Mission uh, was introduced in 2008. But post-demonetization, again, that's an indicator where you see uh, that there's a slowdown. So infant mortality is improving, but improving at a slower pace. Then some results from National Family Health Survey. Part of this was done uh, just before COVID, and part of the survey was done after COVID. And these are indicators of undernutrition. If I can draw your attention to just the stunting, the second uh, green and blue here. And uh, why stunting? Stunting because uh, stunting is an indicator not just of uh, the proportion of children who are undernourished. So stunting basically is uh, th those children whose heights are below what is expected for their age. right? And uh, various surveys show, based on which the WHO standards are made, that young children across the world grow in a similar pattern if they are given all the right conditions. So based on those growth standards, you measure how many children under five do not are two standard deviations away uh, from that uh, mean growth for their uh, height for their age. And in India, it is so ideally it should be less than 5%. In India, it, it was 38.4% in 2006. And it's come down to only 35.5% in 21. That is just a 3 percentage point reduction in stunting in a six-year period. And this is quite slow. One of the ways to look at how it is slow is if we compare it to the previous two NFHS surveys. We saw about a 1 percentage point decline each year. So it came down from 48 to 38. So now that this has happened in um, six years, this survey, we would have expected it at least to come down from 38 to 32, which was still slow, which is not good enough. The government of India's own portion abhiyan, which was started in 2017, targeted a two percentage point reduction in stunting each year. Right? And in the name of portion abhiyan, there's a new app, mobile phones were distributed. I'll talk about it a little more later. But so you have a target, you have a national nutrition mission set up. After that, you see uh, that the uh, improvement in stunting has actually slowed down. And like I was saying, stunting is 
it's an also uh, kind of a representation of overall health and food security of people and not just it it's a good indicator that is telling us how the community is doing as well and not just that particular uh, child because it's giving you the average distribution of heights which is not determined over one month or it's not about the child got diarrhea the last month or there was a malaria uh, or covid or anything this happens over a period of time the other uh, indicators like you can see not much improvement and some of them we actually see a worsening like anemia already very high levels of anemia and that has actually increased anemia amongst children going up from 58% to 67% anemia amongst uh, women also more than half and actually went up um, i'll quickly skip this but basically to say that if you actually look at this in terms of the um, uh, the spread of the indicator not just taking the average then you see that there's hardly any change in any of these indicators so between 2015 and 21 the simple point being made here is that in all these health and nutrition indicators uh, we know that wages have been stagnant we know unemployment rates are higher we also see that in terms of these outcome indicators in terms of how healthy children are or women are there has been uh, have been stagnant there hasn't been any improvement again from niti ayog because there's not very much data and i wanted to focus on uh, the human development indicators much more than uh, the economic purely economic indicators but the, those also show similar things you have the 17 uh, sustainable development goals and uh, in all of these again you see that if they are green that's when niti ayog is saying that we improved in the last uh, between 19 and 20 if they are red and yellow we have coming down and the red and yellow is quite concerning the reds are in nutrition the second one the goal related to nutrition and food security uh, the fourth one is the goal related to gender empowerment so these are two areas where we're clearly doing worse even by uh, the official uh, data and anyway there our score is quite low so it's a low score which has become worse between 2019 and 20 and number of other things like poverty reduction education all the yellows uh, economic opportunity and so on is areas in which we are not doing very well if you look at those scores uh, what Niti Ayo calls performer but, but a score of 50 to 64 is what we get and the SDGs let's remember these are goals that we are supposed to reach by 2030 so if we go in this speed we're clearly not going to uh, achieve them so COVID happened in this context this was the context even when we talk about the impact of COVID and the impact of pandemic on the lives of people particularly the poor and those in the informal sector we also have to remember that things were not going great for them before COVID either but what COVID did was to kind of amplify the differences uh, bring out uh, the situation to many people who might not have noticed it earlier and made things even much worse for many people so again on impact of COVID and the lockdown although there's not much uh, official data available in the sense of uh, again say an NSS consumption survey uh, we do have a number of studies uh, also studies which have analyzed the CMI data again you don't have to go too far looking for these they're right here in Nazim Premji University that much of this has been done uh, which show that the incomes of the poor have been falling like the state of working Rep India report last year showed that 230 million people have fallen into poverty post COVID food insecurity along with the right to food campaign we have also been doing these surveys in different states and we have been involved in uh, a lot of relief work and responding to distress calls and so on but and helping people access PDS different kinds of work and what we've been it's it we've also been seeing this while speaking to people that the amount of food that they are eating now is less than what they were eating before March 2020 the quality of food that people are eating so if they were eating dal every day those households are now eating dal maybe once a week households in which milk would come for young children now that milk has stopped it comes only for chai maybe once in a while eggs meat more expensive foods have really are beginning to vanish out of the food baskets for many people and we have uh, the, uh, the survey that we did in end 2020 found that over two thirds of the respondents it was a survey which was uh, targeted towards people from uh, marginal marginalized communities but over two thirds of the people said that their food consumption 
towards the end of 2020 was worse than what it was in the beginning of 2020. And like we saw in all the nutrition data that I just showed, the nutrition outcomes in India have been quite poor even before COVID struck. So we can only imagine what it would be, what the impact of COVID would be if even the basic direct kind of determinant of nutrition outcomes, and many determinants for nutrition outcomes, including sanitation, access to health, uh, women's status, and so on. But food is finally something that also uh, determines whether a person is well-nourished or not. And that, when you see clearly that there is a reduction in the quality of diets of people, this could have a much longer-term impact on nutritional um, outcomes. Just one more again. Uh, number to make you understand, uh, there was a s uh, study by IFPRI which found that over 60% of the working population uh, in the country cannot afford on their current wages what is recommended by the ICMR as a nutritious diet. And they calculated this using the cheapest source for each of the food groups. Uh, they called it cost of recommended diet. So if you looked at, if you made a thali and it had the enough amount of calories, proteins, fats, and various multivitamins as recommended by ICMR. And you find what is the cheapest source to get these calories, proteins. 60% of Indians could not afford it. So again, where COVID is showing high unemployment, increasing informality, people might be coming back into employment but earning lower incomes. All of this has had a direct impact on their food security uh, as well. And it's not just these uh, immediate economic factors which has uh, uh, affected people's diets and standard of living, but also disruption in services which were kind of adding, providing that safety net uh, for, again, especially poorer families. So school closures has been a big uh, hit. Uh, of course, it has been a big hit for children for their education. We know, again, a lot of studies now showing that these almost two years that children didn't go to school is not just two years that they didn't go to school, but they've even forgotten what they knew before the schools closed. So now when they come back, they're not just coming back as if nothing happened and they were looking at their phone one day and today they're looking at uh, a teacher. But like today, uh, Mani was telling me that in an area where he went, children have forgotten to how to hold a pencil, for instance. Right? So children have forgotten letters, children have forgotten how to read. So school closures have, and we can think of the various ways in which this would have increased the inequality in education and related to all the other inequality that one talked about. But school closures also meant the closure of the midday meal, which for many children was many times the first meal of the day. In many states, that was the only place where a child got to eat an egg. In many states, that was the only place where a child got to eat a puri, unless there was a wedding or some dawat happening somewhere. This also stopped. And if you again go out and ask, that's something that children really missed. And so again, the food at home that is available has reduced. Food, one meal that you used to get from somewhere else, which had varying quality, but there was some minimum basic uh, dal and chawal that you would get in most parts of the country, that also stopped. Along with that, same with Anganwadi children, much younger children, pregnant women and so on. Along with that, disruption in health services as well. Particularly in the first year, in 2020, we saw that the regular immunization stopped, antenatal care services stopped, and we still don't know what all this means for child health, what it meant for infant mortality and so on, because we don't have the data. But we have a number of individual stories which should not have happened. I mean, access to an institutional delivery was the right of every woman. There was, one cannot accept that because there was COVID, you had women not being able to go to a hospital for delivery, or they were stopped on the way, or you had women even in Delhi, in a huge big city like Delhi, where home deliveries increased uh, because of uh, all non-COVID health services kind of getting disrupted. So you had the food services not happening at the same time, all other health services being disrupted um, as a result of COVID. And then we start talking about recovery, right? So again, if you read the papers, you'll see that some, this whole thing about K-shaped recovery versus V-shaped recovery and so on, which is that are we, we, the GDP, of course, finally it all comes down to GDP. GDP reduced 2020-21. 
This year it's gone up again, so all is fine. Right? One is not talking about any of these other indicators. There's a little bit of noise finally about schools being closed for so long and that they should be opened. At the same time, we have all kinds of reasons for why schools keep getting closed even after they are opened. Kind of showing how uh, education of uh, of uh, people, I mean, how low a priority it is for governments and seems to be for most people um, as well. So the only discussion is on the GDP. I won't get into it very much. That's not my area of work. But this is something I understand and I'm sure all of us can understand that if there was a negative growth one year and if you're compared measuring growth by the base is the previous year's growth, so if your income, say GDP, was 100 rupees last year and it came down to 93 rupees this year, next year it becomes 97 rupees also, it shows a growth. Right? And that's what our V-shaped recovery is all about. We now have a positive growth again. But if you actually look at the per capita income, the, the private consumption, it's lower. What people are spending on buying things, it's still less than what it was before COVID. So the other shape that people are talking about is the K-shaped recovery. This one is, so V is that the growth went down, went up. K is that it's, it went, incomes went up for the rich and went down for the poor, which is what it seems has happened. Again, this, what I've put here is from something called the ICE 360 degree uh, survey, which is again a survey conducted by a private organization, over two lakh respondents. Um, the data is very expensive, so this is just what was released in the Indian Express based on their press uh, note, but it very clearly shows that the income for the bottom 60% uh, fell between 2015 and 2021 is what they're talking about. Whereas for the top 4%, you actually saw a positive growth through it. So again, in the pandemic, the other thing that we are seeing is that the inequality is increasing. And like I was saying this time, it's not that everybody is growing. So if you're running a race, everyone's moving forward, but the people winning the race are moving much faster forward, so the gap is reducing. What we're seeing now is you're running a race, the people moving forward are moving towards the finish line. The ones behind seem to have turned direction and moving back to the start line. Right? That's the difference that we see post, uh, definitely post the pandemic, but post 2015, uh, possibly. Right? So the, the, this adage of rich getting richer and poor getting poorer is really something that uh, the country is experiencing right now, uh, even in terms of income statistics. And what I showed you earlier was to show that even when the rich, the poor were becoming better off, their incomes were increasing, but everything else was not improving in the rate in which it should have been improving, in terms of anemia, in terms of uh, stunting, in terms of various other um, such direct indicators that we uh, look at. So in this context, how do we understand that the, uh, the whole welfare state, all these programs that we have, are they completely useless? Uh, because we have the PDS, you have the Narega, you have old age pension scheme, you have midday meals, you have Anganwadi, you have all of these. Uh, did they do anything at all? How do we look at these? Uh, because I'm going to be making a case for them to be expanded. Yeah, but we often also hear that these are useless, that the implementation is very poor, there is so much corruption, and you also seem to be hearing a narrative that they are, they are really okay in the side. Some people are left out, Till they come and join the line, we'll give them something. But what we must be focusing on really is on that growth rate and improving that. And to, to improve the growth rate, you need to do investment and you need to talk about industry and all of that. I am not saying that's not important, but I'm saying that just by doing that, do we really achieve things like nutrition and so on? What, are the, what is the role of direct government intervention? So in, during COVID, these uh, relief measures of the government, uh, they played an important role and they were very useful in exposing both the strengths as well as the weaknesses of the welfare architecture. So many more people at least got interested in things like PDS and Narega. Uh, many of the gaps that many of us working on these schemes saw from earlier became even more visible. One doesn't have to now work very hard to show that this is the gap and this is what the strength is because it's become easier to actually uh, see them. So one of the things where one felt very vindicated was that this existing institutional framework of various programs, particularly food entitlement and social protection schemes, they definitely allowed for a quick response. So if you look at 
the discussions before COVID the last few years, we have heard things like Manrega is a monument for the failure of the previous government. We have heard uh, the economic survey every year has had a chapter where they've said that the National Food Security Act is a complete drain on resources, that the PDS uh, coverage should be reduced, that too much money is being spent on it. But what we saw is that in this time of crisis, it's because we had these schemes already in place. You had a PDS, uh, however faulty PDS that it was. But you had a PDS, you had a list of people who had ration cards, you, were, you had fair price shops in the villages. So it didn't take very long to say, okay, we are giving five, uh, and you had 90 million tons of food grains in your FCI go-downs. Uh, so it didn't take very long to say, okay, there is distress, this is what we need to do, and we have the system in place to do that. Same with the Narega, you had an act. You have a system already where people demand for work and you're supposed to provide work. The wage rates are decided. There are flaws in all of that. The wage rates in Narega, for instance, have not kept pace with minimum wages or inflation. Uh, in PDS, there are exclusions and so on. But still, that having this welfare architecture, which was being attacked from every direction before COVID, that all of this should be closed because it's a complete leakage on the system, was really what kept the system going when COVID happened. So they had their flaws, and I will come to them. But before that, what we do see, and again we see from various uh, field studies and the mobilization work that we are doing, that the many households, if they did not have this PDS, like in Delhi, there was a big issue in Beach May for a couple of months. The Gehu would have a lot of, uh, it was very poor quality, so they would have to spend a lot of time to clean it. So if they actually got five uh, kgs after they cleaned it, what would remain would be four kgs or three and a half kilos. But if they did not have that, it was starvation. If they did not get whatever few days of work that they got in Narega, things would have been even worse. Not saying that much is enough, not at all. But it is very clear, if we did not even have it, what it would be like is something that was there for everybody to see. Whether the government accepts it or not, they used these. And if these were not there, they would have had a much more difficult time. Uh, in reaching people, and particularly I think it's PDS and Narega, which uh, did get expanded, not to the extent that was necessary, uh, and a little bit in the first period, immediately after the lockdown, the social security pensions uh, also was expanded, they gave a little bit of extra money, you might have heard of money being put in Jandan Yojana bank accounts, old age pensions uh, getting 1500 rupees extra and so on, and also the supplementary nutrition to schools and uh, Anganwadis, they were closed, but in some states, in the form of dry rations, they continued. And where they continued, again, much appreciated. For instance, in Orissa, uh, you had these uh, very heartwarming scenes of, uh, Orissa gives children eggs now five days a week in the midday meal. So every 10 days, they would hand over a whole carton of eggs to the uh, household. And again, if that was not there, there was no egg in that village. There was no way they could afford it. Right, so where it worked, it, it did uh, help. Also, we saw that the public health system, which again is in shambles, has huge uh, vacancies. We saw through the second wave across the country, people didn't get beds, people didn't get oxygen cylinders, and so on. But in this whole debate between public versus private in healthcare, that the public is inefficient, and that is why we've been moving towards an insurance-based a system where the government pays for the insurance for the poor and people can go and access care anywhere in the private sector. You saw that finally, particularly in the earlier phases of the pandemic, it was the public institutions that responded to whatever extent that they did. In the first phase, private hospitals, many of them just closed and the doctors also did not come. Even when they did, there, was, there were issues of overcharging and so on. And then the whole vaccine also. There were issues with the app and Aadhaar and so on initially. But again, think of it, the fact that so many people have been vaccinated, it has happened mainly through the public system. The quota that went to the private sector was uh, unused. So before getting into the gaps and talking about the budget and so on, just want to draw your attention also to just see that this welfare architecture that exists currently is not completely useless. It did play some role through this period of providing some social protection, but it could have done much, much more. And it didn't, and it had the potential to do much more, but it didn't do it 
because there were flaws in design, and one of the biggest flaw was that adequate resources were not given for the system to deliver. And that's where we uh, come to the budget of this year, last year, and many years before that as well. That these systems, what they showed was that in the crime of crisis, they can respond, but they cannot respond if you don't invest in them um, enough. So the hunger watch, which we did in 2020, and we've just completed another round of uh, the hunger watch, which we will release next week. But what we did in 2020 also, for example, we saw that 75% of our respondents had a valid ration card, and 70% of all respondents said that they had been receiving their usual ration, which they normally get for 3 rupees rice and 2 rupees wheat, and also the additional ration which they were getting for poor. This is 70% of all our respondents. If you look at the graphs, if you look at it only amongst those who had a ration card, it comes up to almost 90% of people saying they were getting it. There were problems in this. Uh, it was not uh, always regular. There were delays. Uh, there could have been quantity fraud. It was not free. Somewhere people were asked for money and uh, so on. Narega. If you look at the top graph, again, this is what this government called the monument of failure. But uh, if you look at the top graph, it's on the person days generated from the Narega MIS. And it increased quite a bit in 2020-21. Uh, I think 21-22 is still the full data is not there. But this is, not, this is still less than what the demand for Narega was. Even by the official data, if you look at the website, you'd see there is a gap between the amount of work demanded and how much work was created. But the work created was more than what it was before, it, even in terms of the total individuals who worked, or if you look at it in terms of uh, the person days. However, you had all these issues. In PDS, the big issue has been those who don't have a ration card. So all these stories that I'm telling you about how it kept them away from starvation, it was a huge help and so on, was for those who are lucky enough to have a ration card in the first place. There are 40% of the population who do not have any ration card at all. And one is not, and that 40% includes many who need subsidized food, especially in this time of uh, distress. One simple thing that could have been done is that the National Food Security Act says that 75% of rural areas and 50% of urban population will be covered. Currently, it's on the basis of 2011 census. So if we just use the projected population for 2020, 10 crore more individuals should have been added to the ration card lists. Automatically, if we just said that, OK, the quota will now reflect the current population, Governments could have given out ration cards for 10 crore individuals more. And we had the grain. We had the grain sitting in FCA. Throughout these two periods, continuously, the food stocks have been at record levels. On an average, at 90 million tons, which is, which is a lot. For the whole year, the PDS requires something like 53 million tons. 90 million tons at any given point, but stock keeps getting removed, stock keeps getting added also to that. But that's almost four times what the buffer norms suggest that we should have as a buffer stock. Instead, what we see as a response to exclusions in PDS is the introduction of the One Nation, One Russian Card scheme, ONOR. You might have heard of it. The One Nation, One Russian Card scheme basically says that if you have a Russian card uh, from Bangalore and you have gone to Mysore, you're working in Mysore. So Current, the pre-ONOR system, your ration card in Bangalore meant that in that, maybe say it's a Sarjapur uh, FPS, you could go and take your gra grain only from that. What One Nation, One Ration allows you to do is that you can take your card, actually you don't take your card, you take your finger, and you go to that shop in Mysore, you put it in that biometric device, if it matches, they will give you grain in Mysore as well. And it shows up in the system. So the next day, if you go to the Bangalore shop, they will say, you've already taken it. Sounds like a very simple, great system. It doesn't work so beautifully. Fingerprints don't always match. There are network issues. Uh, mostly people don't even know that they can do this. But without getting into all of that, what it doesn't also solve is what I said earlier, that 40% of the people do not have a ration card at all to begin with. So the One Nation, One Ration works only if you have a ration card. 
somewhere, anywhere in the country. But if you don't have a valid ration card anywhere in the country, then this does not work. And what we found is that most people who are excluded are people who did not have ration cards at all. Many people who are excluded maybe had a ration card in the household, which is there in the village for the rest of the family. But this person is here in the city working. And what that person is looking for is grain or cooked food in the city. Right? So it didn't take care of the uh, exclusions, but that was the only response. So the big problem in PDS has been exclusion, other than last mile delivery issues. Narega again, like I said, the demand has been more than the work generated. So the work generated has increased, but it has still not met the kind of demand there is. Obviously, with increasing unemployment, with reverse migration, more people now in rural areas, there is much more demand for work. There's no other work available. That much work has not been created. And there's also the very big problem of pending wages, which is that people work and then they don't get their uh, wages. Sorry with, <laughs> with the shit for the shut. But schools and Anganwadis shut for two years and no, nothing. I mean, such little public action on something like this. The UNESCO recent report shows that India has had the longest school closures in the world, right? And nobody bothers. Schools can be shut forever, also people don't seem to uh, think about it. No urban employment guarantee. It again seemed like a time where this idea, again an idea where uh, work has happened here as well, uh, would get some kind of attention because urban poverty and urban employment in this whole migrant crisis post the lockdown got a lot of attention, but that issue is also kind of shelved. And for many of these schemes, the issue has been lack of funds. And allocations are declining in real terms or in recent periods. So I'll just show you for each of these what's happening to allocation. So PDS, the first. And again, PDS is the most maligned of all these schemes. Every year, you look at economic survey, you look at the business uh, newspapers, you look at TV panels, people will say subsidies are so high, and there are two subsidies which are most abused, the food subsidy and the fertilizer subsidy. That the first fertilizer subsidy has also been reduced here, that's even more complicated. The food subsidy is more straightforward, you're buying grain at a minimum support price and you're distributing it mostly to people who need it, it's, it's something that they're eating, it's going into their stomachs. So last year, 2021 budget, um, sorry, this is actually 21-22, and the last one is 22-23. Uh, last year in 21, when the budget was presented, the finance minister revised the budget for 2019-20, and it finally the actual figures that are showed this year's budget documents. So just follow this dotted line, okay? Um, the dotted line shows you what the budget document shows the food subsidy to be, right? If you follow the dot, which is if you open the demand for grants of the Ministry of Food and Public Distribution, there is a line saying food subsidy. The amount is what the dotted orange shows. If you look at that, it seems like between 2019, 20 and 2021, the food subsidy went up four times, right? From 1 lakh 8,000 crores to over 5 lakh crores and then it's uh, come down. And that again is used as, look how much went into food subsidy. There's 9% fiscal deficit for that year. A big portion of that is food subsidy. But what was done was a very clever accounting trick. And this is also, again, we need to understand because now looking at the budget in some ways is becoming more and more difficult because it's not very transparent. There are these kind of things in it, which unless you know the details of the program, one might miss, right? So in the PDS, what was basically done is the previous three years, what was actually being spent on the PDS was not being shown on the budget documents. So the Food Corporation of India buys grains and distributes it. The difference between the buying price and the selling price, broadly buying price plus transportation, storage, and so on, which is called the economic cost, and the price at which you sell is the subsidy. Food Corporation of India runs these operations. Government of India then says, okay, itna subsidy hua, here take your money. What Government of India did the four years before COVID was not to pay them and told them, there is this National Small Savings Fund, you take a loan from there, right? Because you already bought this from the farmers, so you need the money from somewhere. We don't want to show a higher fiscal deficit in our books, so you take the money from NSSF NS, as a loan and we'll think about it later. 
And when COVID happened, when you could have a phys higher fiscal deficit, that opportunity was used to pay back all the old loans that Government of India owned, FCI, which came up to about 3.3 lakh crores. So this 5,41,000 crores that we see, of that 3.3 lakh crores is what you had already spent. But this year you feel like this is a good year for the market to show a higher fiscal deficit, we won't have much of a problem, let us clean our books. That's all it was. So it does not truly reflect additional grain being given. What is the true reflection if you adjust for this? So in the blue line what I've done is that I've added the loan amount in the years when they took loan and I've subtracted the loan amount the year the loan was paid back. Right? There you still see an increase because of this free grain that was given to those who had ration card, but the increase is much less than it was earlier. And as a proportion of GDP then, it doesn't work out to be something so huge. And in the current year's budget estimate, 22-23, you see actually it is 80,000 crores less than what it was for 21-22 which clearly indicates that this free grain, which I'm saying that for people who got them was very useful and should actually be expanded for more people, should include not just grains, but include pulses and oil, because we're finding these are the things people are not eating, um, actually has now a lesser budget, which means probably after March, they will stop this uh, scheme, because right now it's been announced only till March. This has a number of schemes run by the Ministry of Women and Child Development, all to do with uh, nutrition. You have the Anganwadi program, you have the portion or the National Nutrition Mission, you have maternity entitlements, uh, the adolescent girl scheme, uh, the creches. Uh, I've showed them only till 2020, 2021 in this graph, because again, the accounting system changed after 21, so we can't really compare, they kind of changed the names of the schemes and consolidated things. But the main point of me showing this for the previous period, the pre-COVID is to say that not only were the human development outcomes poor earlier, not only were they slowing down in the post-2015 period, the support for these schemes was also coming down even before COVID. Right? So if you look at uh, Anganwadi, you see that 2015-16, there was a sharp drop, there was a lot of halla, there's some recovery, and again 2021, the budget went down. You look at the crash scheme, this orange line here, right? That's again a very, it's a tiny scheme, but it's a scheme addressing the most vulnerable. It's the young child. And it's the young child of the mother who can go out to work if somebody takes care of that child. Or she often takes the child to work, but in more risky kind of situations, if you can leave the child somewhere, she would work with greater peace of mind and the child would be safer. That scheme is just being slashed. National Nutrition Mission on which there's so much halla being made. I mean, if you look at social media, if you look at the billboards, at some point in the last three, four years, you would have seen Portion being shown. Look at the budgets for Portion. 2017, 18, 17 it was announced, 18 was when it was expanded to the whole country. Since then, it, the budget has just been coming down. And if you look at again the breakup of this budget and what it was spent on, it was spent on 70% of this was spent on two things. One was on the software and the mobile phones. Right? So I have no issues with Anganwadi workers having mobile phones. They currently have to fill in 18 registers, so it's great. If they can do it quickly in a phone, nothing like it. But in, on the ground, what you see is they're doing it on the phone and in the register currently. So it's not solved that problem either. And the software was done by some huge multinational company who said that they were not paid properly. So they took the software and they've gone off. So we don't even have the software now. We have a new NIC software, which is quite disastrous, which was done much more cheaper last year. The other component on which money was spent on what is called IEC, Information, Education, Communication, now, we don't know the breakup, but if you just look at the whole publicity around the scheme, much of it was, I think, spent on newspaper ads and billboards and that kind of thing than actually doing some local mela or meeting or whatever it was, which would be much cheaper anyway. Maternity entitlements, again, if uh, people remember, 2016, 31st December, 2016 was the year that demonetization happened in November. 31st December, the Prime Minister made a speech saying that uh, we did this reform, we did demonetization, it caused a lot of hardship, but that's something that we've all, it's a price that we've all had to play to clean up the system, I'm very sorry about it, 
what we are but we are doing various things to improve lives one of the things we are doing is that every mother will now get 5000 rupees that is the scheme right look at the budget for that scheme thoda bahut utha again if you actually look at the number of mothers and multiply by 5000 the budget should be around 12000 crores we gave 2500 2021 half of that right so covid may it's as if births did not happen as if there were no pregnant women because you spent only half the money in giving the maternity entitlement now just comparing this year's budget with last year's like i said because the schemes have changed basically you will see the blue is 2021 22 what has been spent the orange is 22 23 what we propose to spend and what i've done here is adjusted for a 5% inflation right so ideally everything remaining same at least by 5% the budget should have gone up to even continue doing what you're doing because prices have gone up by that much actually it's gone up by little more what i've taken here is 5% except for jal jeevan mission everything else that i've looked at here saksham anganwadi which includes icds Uh, adolescent girls portion crashes and so on the samarthya which includes maternity entitlements and something else national health mission tiny increase uh, mid day meals the overall budget for the health and family welfare ministry nsap is national social assistance program under which pensions are given to old people single women disabled and narega huge decline is what you see in a year where the requirements are higher right because imagine each of these areas in school what are we talking about you like i said you're reopening schools children have forgotten how to hold a pencil that means you can't have the same teacher pupil ratio you can't have the same hours of class you need extra classes for some children you need different kinds of teaching for some other children you need more people you need more funds health children have not got adequate food even what they were getting they coming back you need to give them even better food to catch up like in school ideally you should be giving them breakfast this time so that they come eat breakfast they learn they eat lunch they learn little more they go back the ministry made a proposal saying we want to give breakfast the new education policy says that breakfast should be part of school the finance ministry said it was a proposal for 4000 crores which is really minor if you look at the numbers here 4000 crores is not very much finance ministry got back saying sorry no money right and everything what you see is that the budgets have actually gone down just last i didn't have the time to update this to 22 23 if you look at all the children scheme put together that's also been declining once again showing how children are such low priority the budget for children this year is the least in 11 years last year was the least in 10 years so quickly moving on so to try and wrap up and saying these budgets are low and so on what i the larger point and the lesson that i'm arguing is on the one side you have this whole thing which almost all economists and even business people in the country are saying that there is a demand deficit ki log khareed nahi rahe okay people don't have money to buy and therefore we don't we are not producing there is excess capacity biscuits are not selling motorcycles are not selling consumer durables are not selling and so on now basic those of you who are economics students tells you that where there is the situation of demand deficit what you have to do is put money in the hands of people so that they start buying when people start buying production increases that creates jobs it puts money into more people they start buying more things right simple who do you put this money whose hands do you put this money into right you put it into the hands of those people who will spend and who will spend on things that are produced ideally in labor intensive sectors and spend on things which are produced within the country you know what is the point if you put hands into the money of someone who will invest in the stock market or who will buy gold or who will buy an imported car it really doesn't help the economy that much but if you put the money in the hands of somebody who will buy hair oil who will buy your glucose biscuit who will get your their motorcycle repaired and start using it who will maybe buy better seeds whatever these are things that will revive the local economy as well and what is the way to put money into these people's hands who would spend is precisely things that i talked about manrega right these are daily wage earners they are not hiding the money they're getting they immediately spending it on consumption that's where the demand has been going down pds is a sort of an income transfer because if you're giving people grain which is an essential 
uh, consumption, that amount of money which they would have spent on rice and wheat, they will spend on other things. Pensions, all of these are things that people uh, spend. So what is needed, which everybody is saying is greater spending in this time, because greater spend, the government is one uh, source which can afford to spend at such times of crisis, and therefore they should spend more, and I'm adding on to that, which not only me, but many are still saying, although no consensus, that that more spending should be on welfare spending, because then the hand, money goes directly to the hands of the poor, whose incomes have been falling, who are also people who are big spenders. Big spenders in the sense that they spend whatever they uh, have. But if you look at the budget, the hit has been mainly taken by the social sector, like I just uh, showed you. And overall expenditure to GDP ratio in the budget is also lower. Right? So overall, as a proportion of GDP, government is spending less. It is showing an increased spending on capital expenditure, much of which is on building highways and ports and so on. What does that mean? Somewhere the money has fallen, and the money has fallen in the social sector. And I'm arguing that for revival of the economy, this debate of capital expenditure versus welfare is a wrong way of looking at it, and that the welfare and social sector needs to be seen as very much part of the economy, not as an afterthought. That it's not residual, it is very much related to the nature of growth and the economy. The fact that budgets for Anganwadis and schools have been falling, the fact that there's so much inequality in human development outcomes has to do with the kind of growth that we have had. So you can't say that the growth will affect you, will make these things worse, but let's wait for even better growth so that these things get taken care of. It's very clear that the kind of growth you have itself affects uh, the kind of human development uh, indicators you have as well. And on top of that, better human development for the economist who would still not be convinced is good for growth as well. So we keep talking about this demographic dividend, which has become a demographic curse, because we have so many young people, but they don't have the skills, they're not healthy enough, they're not productive. That's because we didn't invest in them. So if you invest in people, they're better educated, they have, they're more healthy, you have better health systems, productivity also increases, it contributes to growth. You have human capital is how uh, the economists talk about it. And like I just discussed, investment in the social sector can also contribute to the economy through the multiplier effect. One way that I've already discussed by putting money into the hands of people who are beneficiaries, also by putting money into the hands of those who are delivering these services, because many of these services are very labor intensive. So if you're running a crash, you cannot have more than one worker for more than, uh, say, 10 children, if they're children under two. Even 10 is too many, right? And you can't replace that person taking care of the children with a computer or with a robo or anything else. Many of these are relational, the services that are provided, education, health care, nursing care, uh, old people care, disabled care, early child care, they, that also creates jobs. And again, creates jobs for the kind of people who uh, would actually um, spend. And of course, it would reduce the unpaid work burden on women and allow them to participate in the labor market uh, much more. And added reason for India to do it because we've not been doing it very well. India is amongst the lowest spenders in the world on social sector, whichever ways you look at it. Social protection, there's an example of the World Social Protection Report. Uh, health and education, our aim has been 3% for health and 6% for education. We are at 1.3% for health and about 4% for education, spending as a percentage of uh, GDP. So our welfare spending uh, is poor and compared to many other countries as well. Uh, for instance, this UNESCO report, look at just the situation right now. 43% of teachers in this country have no contracts, school teachers. Right? So it's not just employing more teachers, it's improving the quality of work. The same with nurses. 62% of schools have classrooms rated as being in good condition, that is 38% do not even have good uh, classrooms. They estimate that about 11 lakh more teachers need to be employed. Various things. You just go to, those who are interested, just go to Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha and search vacancies in the questions. You have different members of parliament who asked for figures and vacancies in different ministries. And you'll find 14,000 posts in central education institutes. Eight lakh vacancies in group A to C post only in central government. If we got the data for all the state government uh, vacancies, this would again go up. So if you look at public employees per thousand, we are again led to believe that India has this very heavy bureaucracy and we have too many people and you have to remove people.
But if you look at the public employees per thousand population, it's 111 in Brazil, 57 in China, and 16 in India. Right? So we actually have very few people. We have many vacancies based on our own norms. And then if we upgrade our norms to global standards, we have many more vacancies. I'm not saying that the government is the solution to the entire job problem in the country. But there are a large number of jobs that the government also needs to create to be able to do all these other things that we have just discussed. And at this time of crisis, when you're talking about a demand deficit, you're talking about human development indicators being hit, this is what needs to be done. But what we see is a push towards fiscal con consolidation, a focus on digital solutions. I gave you one example in One Nation, One Russian. This budget, I've talked about so many things that one can do in school education. I'm not even an expert on school education. Budget has only one solution, which is 200 TV channels. You have Kisan drones, you have uh, all kinds of technological kind of solutions, and also privatization at the cost of reducing public uh, provision. These seem to be the trends that one is seeing. And what the government is spending in, as a COVID response is also amongst the lower side globally, if you look at the IMF data. So just to finally conclude, this is my last slide. So there is much that can be done. Many felt that COVID is an opportunity to do these things because finally people are waking up to the reality that this is the world that we live in and that there would be public support for these kind of uh, policies, so there can be a lot that can be done towards universal provision of basic public services. I talked about PDS, I talked about schools, uh, one can talk about health. Cash transfers also many countries have done in the form of social security pensions and so on, and creating decent jobs in the public sector. Filling these vacancies, improving the job quality of people who are working, ashas, anganwadi workers, midday meal cooks, all these put together are 60 lakh women who are working in government programs to provide basic services, none of them are recognized as workers or employees by the government. They don't even earn minimum wages. Imagine if they all earned what they should be earning for the work they're doing, how much more they would buy, how much that could contribute to rec uh, recovery, uh, the economic recovery that we are talking about. So the need of the R is to bring the focus on to welfare provision, not as charity not as something you do because some people are left out of the race, but also something which is a core strategy towards recovery and not to pitch welfare spending against capital expenditure. If you want to reduce your fiscal deficit, there are two sides to a fiscal deficit. The revenues you collect, the spending you're doing. Why are we only talking about the spending? Where are the revenues? Corporation tax has been reduced. Corporate profits are increasing, right? So. Let's talk about generating reviews, let's talk, uh, revenues, let's talk about wealth taxes, let's talk about how you can tax corporate profits at this time where profits are rising and wages are falling. Else, it's unfortunately a missed opportunity. I don't want to be cynical. I still hope that having going through this very deep crisis, what will come out of this hopefully would be a different way of looking at welfare itself. As, so welfare also is not a great word, but as not being something outside of the economy, but actually that you build a strategy for recovery where welfare is at the center. Then probably the initial slides that I showed with the kind of human development outcomes we have would also look different in a few years from now. Thank you. We'll open the floor for question and answers and hopefully uh, the presentation that Deepa made would have left you wondering with many more queries that you have uh, in your mind as to how do we read these charts and figures and uh, and what we just heard, correct? Uh, so through your presentations of numbers, it was, I mean, I'm a non-economist, but it was so easy to follow and very nice to see that. I was wondering if you can speak a bit on what are the implications for civil society, the NGO sector? Um, from what I understand, the budget directly, one can't really see what the implications would be. But overall, the direction in which it's going would have implications for even civil society. What is 
the mainstream done thing for even say NGO intervention. So we see a lot of that going on. For instance, this technological solutions, for, for example. Uh, it's not just the government pushing these. Now a lot of funding, therefore, even NGO funding comes for an app development for education or developing some kind of app for telemedicine. Some of these are useful also. But it again, because the whole uh, logic of delivery of services getting into this efficiency argument that education has to be efficient. What is the returns you're getting for each rupee you're spending? Once you start assessing uh, these things also by those same metrics that you do, say, industry, uh, then that affects the civil society as well, because that, is, that becomes like the accepted uh, sort of norm. So a lot of work that was being done earlier, for instance, even in terms of rights-based work, in mobilizing communities to demand accountability, or let's say social audits, now are replaced by um, digital solutions. So you have some Aadhaar-based authentication. So there is no role for civil society, actually, because the data is not there. There's nothing you can do at the local level. Everything is becoming so centralized. You do, you go to the BDO, you mobilize people, you say, Narega wages nahi mila, he will say, MIS mein problem hai. Upar se nahi aaya. And the, the person there can see what you're saying is right. Like in Delhi, we have examples, we take a person and we say, ye dekho, inke naam pe rashan card hai, aap isko pehchante hai, par uska anguta nahi lag raha hai. Why don't you give it to her? You know who she is. He'll say the system doesn't allow me. And there's nothing we can do. We know the system doesn't allow. The, the Russian dealer bichara wo bhi kuch nahi kar sakta hai. Because the thumbprint is not matching. And so in many ways, this, this way of operating the social sector uh, schemes has made it more decent, centralized in the name of decentralization. So it's each individual is supposed to be empowered because everything is now digital. But actually what it has done is taken away human control at the level at which you can interact with humans. And then, then that also becomes a big question for civil society also. Because traditionally, a lot of rights-based organizations working on these kind of things, on entitlement schemes, the modus operandi has been to mobilize locally. Collective action, go place a demand and make it happen. Here you do collective action, you go, you place a demand, but that fellow who you can access will say, I can't do anything about it. And he really can't do anything about it. So that is one problem. The other is also the entry of all these big players into what was earlier a NGO space. The Baiju's also talks like it's uh, doing charity. It, nowhere does it say, hey, yeah, we are making profits. No, it will say, we are uh, providing education for the poor also. If uh, Apollo opens up a health center in a PPP mode, where they are making a great deal with the government, getting free land, getting assured returns for 20 years and so on, but they'll still sell it as like they're doing some big favor. Then some chota charitable hospital is nowhere in the scene. I think it's more the political economy of the privatization and centralization which affects the civil society. Um, thank you, ma'am, for the presentation. Um, since you've worked with the right to food movement, my question is around that. I read recently that um, Niti Aayog recommended that the NFSA coverage be reduced to an overall of a 40% in both rural and urban. What is the, um, what is the response from the um, from yeah. you all who've been working so actively to universalize it and how it's important like we've seen now. Uh, thank you and if I can give a slightly long answer to that. So the reason the Niti Aayog or uh, economic survey is saying it is quite simple, no? It is what I'm showing. They show the orange line in the slide that I showed and they'll say, oh, so much money is getting wasted, people are not so hungry, we should be spending it better, maybe do a direct cash transfer. This is just waste of money. One thing is the waste of money argument itself is based on false information that they're giving us. The second is why have, we be, why have we been making this demand for universalization? It's not just because one ideologically thinks universalization is good, particularly in the case of PDS, there has to be some logic, no? Three, four different things. One, the need is quite large. If you looked at the anemia figures, if you looked at the stunting figures, if you look at the poverty figures. Two, in a country like India, we are pursuing two goals simultaneously. You want the farmer to get an assured price. You want the consumer to not pay a high price. And many of the farmers are consumers also. 80% of the farmers are net consumers of grains. That they're growing, they're eating part of it, that's not enough. They're buying from the market as well. 
for that farmer the grain that she is selling we want her to get a good price the grain that she is buying we want her to not have to pay a very high price and across the world you'll see that keeping food prices low is something that everybody wants to do like if you go in the west also food if you're cooking on your own is very cheap and if you look at it in ppp terms food that's that is the aim because that's your main uh, consumption right so in but here where you have this kind of dual objective where you want to give the farmers assured prices in america only 2% of the population is farmer and they give them huge concessions they give them in income transfers they have uh, rigged the wto in a way that it favors them our farmers don't have any of that and we have 50% almost of our population depending on farmers on farming so we have to make farming a viable operation for them so you need a regulator you need somebody to assure the prices to the farmers at the same time for those who need it give it at a, a lower price which is why again you need a pds system who do you give it in a country again where 80% of your population earns less than 18000 rupees a month how do you differentiate one from the other if you say i'll give it only to 40% the but if you go to a village and you try to identify 40% it's very difficult you can identify the bottom 10% you go and say sabse garib kaun hai panch das parivar identify ho jayenge it will be an old person single woman a dalit house which doesn't have any land and so on sabse ameer kaun hai that also usually gets identified if you take the in between 80 and you say now draw a line and say who's poor who's not poor it's very difficult to do that because in again the indian situation there's very little difference one month one household might seem better next month that household head might be diagnosed with tb then that household is not any more doing better right so people are just above the poverty line below the poverty line it's difficult to measure so what you then have is the kind of system we have which used to be called apl bpl before where some people get into the bpl is some don't but you don't see any qualitative difference in their lives so the best way to deal with this is to just universalize it give it to everybody because there are two kinds of errors you can have in targeting one error is that you're leaving out poor the other is you're including somebody who's not so poor the errors itself are such that if one is small the other is big so you have to choose between the two errors which is preferable for any democratically elected government you should be more concerned about not leaving out the poor than about one rich person coming and standing in that pds line it's okay it's grain after all they'll eat it you have a system where it doesn't get leaked out right and also universalization puts greater pressure on the system so there is this famous uh, amartya sen quote that services which are meant exclusively for the poor end up being poor services only the poor are using it and that's what happened to pds it was working better the, then once in a village only few families had access and those were the families without much power it didn't improve once the middle class and the better of abandoned government schools the quality of government schools actually went down so there are multiple reasons last that the states which have universalized pds on your universal have the lowest leakages tamil nadu and chatisgarh so there's a lot of evidence also to show that it works most of it yeah so i did not follow the uh, this thing um uh, to 2022 uh, budget presentation but uh, i have seen a lot of articles talking about the discrepancies in the mg narega uh, payment structure in the past uh, few years uh, so when this uh, uh, 30% re reduction in the budget in 2022 uh, so i'm curious to know what is the rationale that the uh, finance minister has presented in the um, presentation so i because i did not follow it and also i i'm curious probably i'm coming from a very uh, immature uh, mind but i'm no curious. no um, it <laughs> it's the right question to ask but there is no answer unfortunately see one thing is when the finance minister is presenting the budget she doesn't present the rationale for the budget right yeah. she decides to focus on certain things in the speech she didn't mention the narega at all the speech focused on a 25 year vision which is not what a budget should be de doing in any case later there have been media interviews which have been given by bureaucrats and so on and the rationale they seem to be giving is that the covid is behind us and that recovery has happened so there won't be as much demand for narega 
seems to be their assumption which i am saying is a false assumption because firstly this thing of this it, this is a low base effect you we had negative growth so anything looks good this year and the growth that we are seeing this year is not the same for all classes of people some classes actually uh, incomes are still continuing to fall so actually i think and many people think demand will be more but only time will tell can i ask a question if you don't have a question then my question is not to deepa to you people uh there were months in the year 2020 when all of us were forced to sit at home many of us who were teachers were forced to sit at home and teach to you by staring at our screen and when you get bored from teaching by staring at the zoom screens and google meets and microsoft teams and what not then you thought that you will turn on television news in afternoon and would see whether the finance minister is announcing a covid relief package correct whether she is trying to bite the pill of increasing the fiscal deficit in the year 2020 2021 and allocating more resources and there was this marathon press conference that nirmala sitaraman did so my question is how many of you have watched those marathon press conferences that sitaraman did uh, in the year 2020 month of march with anurag thakur that guy from her party from himachal pradesh and we were told about pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana and all that how many of you have seen those press conferences do you remember that she said if a district has one covid positive patient you can use 25% of unspent fund from which head on meeting covid time emergency health sector expenditure district mineral foundation trust funds some brave journalist when she opened up her floor for question and answer asked her how how much money is lying unspent in district mineral foundation trust nationally i mean these are local level funds so you you are supposedly thought to feel that money doesn't travel all the way up to delhi and then sit there and waits for the opportune moment to travel back trickle down when the journalist asked the finance minister the question she didn't have the figure immediately you can you can go and watch this on youtube actually those press conferences are there she looks at the secretary secretary looks at papers and he rattles out a figure saying 25000 crores i have been someone who was working with mining affected communities before starting my phd in the year 2009 2010 having come back from tiss after having written a report on a large dam and what it was going what what it was doing to irrigation in gujarat so like i know 2009 to 10 and how many years it took for district mineral foundation trusts to come into being six long years of advocacy 2015 you amended mmdr and then you created district mineral foundation trusts you go to a mining affected community person in jharkhand bihar andhra pradesh telangana and ask him what do you call dmf and you know what the answer he gives it's not district mineral foundation trust sir it's district magistrate fund they call a meeting all the line department usually the dmf budget is spent like that and during covid then when she needed to spend from her consolidated fund of india she robbed this fund tamil nadu nfsa this covid time ration i have a government paper leaked to me through media contacts that says they charged building and other construction workers welfare board not only for rice also for transportation those of you who want that letter i can give it to you gujarat similar thing building and other construction workers welfare board unspent money went into meeting nfsa provisions 
So again, when you read budget figures, please do read it along with. And uh, my recommendation, I mean, so like look at the 2022-23 budget speech, but go back to those marathon press conference um, and see the announcements and see whether she is saying that I am giving it out of Consolidated Fund of India. Because special purpose funds are special purpose funds. So if you are giving a vaccine to a central VISTA construction worker from building and other construction workers welfare board of Delhi, and then the Delhi state government, which is a non-BJP government, has a planner saying, ye tika karan Delhi sarkar dwara aap mazdoor bhaiyo ke liye muft mein karwaya ja raha hai. Then you know what is the narrative that we are confronted with. First, you are taking the money out of construction workers welfare board fund that has remained unspent for all these years, which should have gone to fund his children's education, his wife's illnesses, and things like that. And today when COVID is there and you are giving him vaccine, you are taking the money out of that. And then you say, Muft mein karwaya jar. What is the social welfare imagination? That even parties that came to power on the plank of anti-corruption movements have gone into. Thanks. This was quite a long uh, if I can just to... add, these are good examples for two things I was trying to say. One is that the budget is not very transparent. It is, there are many things hidden in it. And the second is later, ye muft mein karaya. every country in the world has given vaccines for free. In America also people got vaccine for free. All vaccinations in India have been for free. It's not only COVID, na? Polio to khinch khinch ke railway station platform mein, jahan dig gaya, bula bula ke de rahe the. So, again, 